Hello. I'd be a terrible James Bond. <laughs> but, all right, let's see some of my slides. Who's heard of Cloudflare here? Okay, quite a few people, good. All right, well, I'm going to not tell you too much about the company, but I'm going to tell you about writing code on the edge. So what I'm going to talk a little bit about is serverless computing. And we've just started to hear about this term, and Cloudflare plays in this area. And I think there's a problem with it, which is that people aren't using it enough. And the reason I'm going to tell you about that is about Cloudflare. If you go back in time, the first search engine, the first really usable search engine was AltaVista, which was made by DEC. And the reason they made it was to try and sell people mini computers. And the problem with the mini computers is they're expensive and not that powerful. And what happened was Google came along and said, we can use commodity servers and we can get 10x the power. We can use Linux. We don't need these expensive DEC. And no one's ever heard of AltaVista again, or DEC, frankly. And then VMware came along and said, commodity servers are too complicated, use virtual machines, and now you can start to share the resources, and you get about a 10x you know, units of compute. You can now have many, many virtual machines. But virtual machines themselves are fairly complicated to use. And so containers have come along, and the idea is now you've got about another 10x units of compute. You can have a container with something in it. But... Now we get to serverless. Now, how? what's the unit of compute of serverless? And it's really an event-based thing. An event happens and some code executes. So that fundamentally changes what the unit of compute is. It's no longer a machine. It's no longer a process. It's actually a single event. And so, you know, what's the granularity there? Well, we suppose you're doing 500 requests per second, which is nothing for any interesting app. Every second of every day, every month, that's about a billion times more granular units of compute. And I think this is a clear fundamental thing about serverless, is to start to think about very small units of computation that are being run. And this is possible because of new technologies. So, you know, the first generation of serverless was to say containers, really. But the truth of the matter is containers are pretty big. Uh, things to actually manage. They're, they're a solution to a problem that developers have. They don't want to worry about servers. But the reality is I think they're too large. And, re you know, this is an actual data center where the, all those containers run. So if you run things in containers and you go to a cloud provider, you end up running in a small number of locations around the world. But fundamentally, if you have an event-based system, you want it to run very, very quickly very close to the end user to minimize latency. What you don't want is to go to some availability region and have to long haul across the world. So, you know, I think the thing to ask yourself is, what if we started doing compute in terms of just a single event being handled? And how would that change how we think about deploying applications? The key thing is, if you were to do that, if you were to package things up so you could run them as a single event, then your code could run everywhere. And by everywhere, I mean anywhere inside the internet. It could run in an internet availability region, on a server inside a base station for a cell phone, in a device, anywhere. And so I think fundamentally that changes things. And if you're going to run everywhere, then from a developer perspective, it means running nowhere in the sense of not worrying about what the underlying architecture of the machine is, not worrying about containers or VMs or commodity servers or even mini computers. And so today, you know, most people do that. Um, with co-located services. So they'll run some kind of functions thing, um, microservices inside their own data center. But I think there's an opportunity to push this out into the internet if the infrastructure is there. So just imagine something like this. Someone's using a device, they connect to a cell phone tower, and they send an SMS message. And there were events occurring, right? So Twilio gets the message, causes an event to happen, which gets sent to Stripe, and Stripe actually sends an invoice which gets sent to an email provider. And so all these are little discrete bits of functionality which today run in different services. So Twilio has a bit, Stripe has a bit, etc. And, you know, fundamentally these are running in different locations. 
But another option is to run all of this stuff inside the same service provider. So you have many of these services running on one server. And that really is what functions as a service or serverless allows you to do, which is have many things running in the same location. And that's important because of geographic affinity, which matters a lot for some applications, where you don't want to long haul back to some data far away because it's far away. So obviously what I need to talk about is dog walking drones. Uh, this is going to be a thing, I promise you. So, I mean, people don't want to walk dogs. They have dog walking services. And the right solution, clearly, Silicon Valley solution anyway, is to have a drone walk your dog. And that's great. Um, unless you meet other dogs, right? So when you meet other dogs, one of the things you're going to want from your dog walking drones is that they coordinate and they coordinate in fairly real time. First of all, your dog may have friends, but it may also have enemies. And so you don't want your dog to be near the enemy dogs and you want it to be with the friendly dogs. And you know, there are a number of ways to do this. You could have drone to drone communication about who's where, but more likely you're going to go back to some sort of service somewhere. And the problem here is if you, if all these drones talk back to say an Amazon data center, which is on the other side of the world, the latency is gigantic. And so what you really want is geographically local execution of code so that decisions can be made about, you know, don't go this way because that nasty dog is there. And this is something that's made possible by serverless because you can push out these functions into very large networks around the world and not be thinking about you know, availability regions. So here's the world. The dark area is where all the people are. Um, you can see they're all over the place. And uh, in order to really make serverless work, you need to put the functions where the people are, which is fundamentally what Cloudflare did. Now, one of the issues is some bits of the world are really far away. So uh, New Zealand is really far away from Virginia. And if you go from an internet connection in New Zealand to Virginia, you're going over hundreds of milliseconds of latency, which may be enough, given the API calls, for your dog in Wellington to meet the dog it hates. Um, if you're lucky, you might go to Australia. That's still a really long distance and a really low, la really long latency. So you want to push that latency down as much as possible. Now, one of the things that has happened over the last 20, 30, 40 years is we've pushed up bandwidth enormously. This is uh, from a report about global internet connection speeds. So you can see it's just pretty much linearly increasing in terms of bandwidth, which is why you can walk down the street streaming a video right over your phone. At the same time, progress on the speed of light has been really poor. Um, we've, we've done nothing on the speed of light. So the, unfortunately, the speed of light is not changing. Um, also, progress on moving Australia and New Zealand closer has been slow as well. So. We fundamentally cannot fight this without bringing the compute resources near where they need to be executed. So this is what Cloudflare does. Cloudflare right now has 154 locations. These are our pops. We have one here in Ukraine in Kiev. And uh, we're building out where the people are. The idea being that these circles are 10 milliseconds of latency. So later on this year um, and into next year, we'll be building out in West Africa, further into Central Asia and some parts of South America. The idea is, you know, this isn't a war games map, but it should cover the whole population of the planet to be really close to compute. And in our platform, you can run functions anywhere. So this is sort of the comparison that the marketing people like. So if you look at major cloud providers, most of them have limited number of locations where they have servers, which means you're hitting latency to them. Whereas we have about 154, it'll be about 200 soon. Now, if you're going to do this, if you're going to have uh, very, very small functions that run, then you have to have instantaneous start off. You can't have that dog walking drone say, hey, is nasty dog here? I'm going to call that API and then have some cold boot time thing happen. And you're also going to need thousands and thousands of simultaneous, simultaneous tenants because you're going to be running very small applications, very small bits of code, you don't want to have to waste resources and you're going to need secure sandboxing. 
And it turns out this problem has already been solved pretty much, which is in browsers, you're running essentially untrusted code, many different bits of code in the browser in JavaScript. And so what Cloudflare did is we chose to use the V8 engine from Google and we pushed V8 into every one of our nodes around the world. So you can run arbitrary JavaScript on our edge in response to an HTTP request or other events. Um, and of course, V8 supports WebAssembly. So if you don't like writing in JavaScript, you can write in Rust or C or C++ or whatever you feel like. So uh, there was one thing missing though when we did that, which was some sort of storage mechanism. Um, so if you look, think about the way in which Cloudflare works typically, for our customers, you have, you know, a user connects to our nearest cache, they get some cached video or images or web pages, and then there's this long haul back to wherever their app runs, might be in Amazon, might be somewhere else, and then they have some local storage, which I call a database. And, you know, what adding serverless functions did was it moved the application close to the end user within about 10 milliseconds of the end user, which gives you really fast interactive apps. One of the things that's interesting about this is prior to this change, if you go back to this world, there are two places to deploy code here. One is in the end user's device. That tends to be slow to update, particularly if it's a mobile phone. It's untrusted, but it's highly interactive because the latency to the user is as fast as their eyes work. On the, on the server side, the latency is long, it's slow, but you trust what's in there and you can update it when you want. What happens with these serverless platforms is you get a little bit of the both worlds. You can push out new code very, very rapidly and it's in a trusted environment because it's running within our servers or whatever serverless platform you choose. For us, typically a global deploy of code is about five seconds if you push out new code. But it's close to the end user, so it's highly interactive. Not quite as interactive as on the device, but still pretty interactive. Now, let's just talk about Mars because at some point we're going to go to Mars. Mars really kind of sucks for round trip time. Depending on where it is, unfortunately Mars moves, it's six to 45 minutes of round trip time. So you don't want to do APIs there. So if you move your application to Mars, because at some point Cloudflare will be on Mars, then you can run your work, your serverless functions there. But if you have to hit storage, then you're going back to Earth through the deep space network and it's very, very slow. So what you, yeah, and that makes Elon mad. And um, the bad thing about making Elon mad is he tweets things. So I don't want him to tweet things. So how do we make Elon happy? Well, actually, just before we make Elon happy, the equivalent of Mars is New Zealand. I don't mean that negatively to anyone who lives in New Zealand. It's just far away. All right. So, you know, the typical application, what we've done is we've pushed out uh, database functionality into the network as well. So we built a globally distributed database which can be accessed from any of our locations and synchronizers around the world. And then only if you need to go back to Earth or the West, um, do you have to go to the central DB. And if you completely need, for most applications, you don't need the central DB at all. You can push entirely into, into the serverless platform and then you've got everything running within about 10 milliseconds of the end user. You've got your application, you've got cache for static data and you've got the uh, data store, which is being synchronized globally. And that's great, because then you can have two worlds, you can have, you know, on Earth, and you can have on Mars, and you can be running things without having to worry. And then Mars to Earth synchronization can happen when necessary, and that makes Elon happy. All right, so let's just talk about sort of the real world of this kind of stuff. Um, what are people doing with this today? So I thought it'd be interesting to look at some, some real examples of this. Um, Online maps, so there's a game called Factorio, which is about making factories. You people build these incredibly detailed factories and there are maps of them. Much like a sort of Google Maps style, you can zoom in and out of these things. And the person who runs the site Factorio Maps was paying a fortune to traditional cloud providers to actually provide that zoom functionality. And what they decided to do was move, make this whole thing serverless. It gave them two advantages. One, it was cheaper, and the other one was that they, it was much, much faster because the zoom was happening close to the end user. And the way this works, they use a piece of functionality called Leaflet, which has these layers of zoom where you're pulling into different levels. And they chose to store those levels with Google Cloud and Backblaze. 
And um, depending on where they are, one of those two is faster or slower, and also there's different cost advantages. And then what they decided to do was, when someone's actually requesting a tile in a map, they would race the two cloud providers and see who provided the response fastest. And if they race them, then they get the best thing for the end user. And they can do that in the edge. They can do that in the serverless platform. So the code actually looks like this. They literally are making two requests, one to Google APIs, one to Backblaze, and they literally just fetch both, both tiles and they race them. There's, you know, use promise.race and they see who comes back first. And so they're actually able to balance across the two providers. And they can do more sophisticated things, but this is the actual real code he's running on the edge. And there's a little bit more at the bottom where he returns the actual tile. But if you think about it, this is code he wrote and pushed out, and then it's making the call to Google and to Backblaze. And for both Google and Backblaze, Cloudflare has relationships with them, which makes pulling from them very, very cheap or free, depending on which one you use. Um, at the same time, he wants logging, because now he's pushed his code out into the edge. And so he uses StatHat, and he just makes a call. He just makes a call out to StatHat and says, you know, I, I serve to this user, this tile, this performance information. Again, all running inside JavaScript. And it's all asynchronous, so what can happen here is that the tile can be served to the end user, and the worker keeps on running in our in our code in, in in our server wherever that server is, and actually does the log, and then it terminates. And so this is very very lightweight. And what we've seen is with companies there, uh, there are a number who are using it, and it's a very small number of milliseconds to start this up. Remember that V8 was optimized for running in your browser and actually running the JavaScript code for web pages. Its cold start time is a, is a single digit number of milliseconds for what we're doing. So we're adding almost no latency to these applications. Another thing we saw a company do was uh, data loss prevention. So what they wanted to do was see if anything leaked out of their database. And there are very, very expensive tools to do this. Um, they replaced those expensive tools with the following six or seven lines of JavaScript. So what they did was they embedded in their database a canary value. I changed it here to, you know, this is a secret. Uh, this, this is a secret thing. Um, but they actually put a, like a hash value in that no one would ever see. And then they literally just streamed the body through, um, through the worker. And if it ever had that value, they blocked it. And so they made themselves a DLP solution in seven or eight lines of code and kicked out their DLP vendor. Uh, at the same time, they decided they'd call pager duty. So if they ever saw that, they'd serve to the end user and say, okay, you, that thing's blocked because obviously something's leaking, someone's figured out a SQL injection or something. And then they wrote a small amount of code. I mean, most of it's actually putting the headers together to call pager duty and actually wake someone up because someone's found a vulnerability in the application. All this running in any of the 154 locations Cloudflare has around the world. So where, where they connect, it just happens very, very rapidly. Nothing ever hits their backend. Another thing we've seen people do is geotargeting. So geotargeting is kind of interesting. So, um, you know, here I am in Ukraine. Maybe I maybe I should be served a Ukrainian specific version of a web page. And if I you move to the UK, maybe English, or maybe it should be based on the accept language in my browser or a cookie or something like that. Uh, we saw one customer do this. So. What they decided to do was redirect the user to a country-specific page if the page exists. And rather than having a complete list of all the countries in the piece of code, what they do in the worker is they go off and they try and fetch the country-specific version of the page. If it exists, they return a 302 and redirect. And if it doesn't exist, they serve the standard page. That the person's going to. And they use that using a header of ours that gives you the, the country code. But they could have done it with anything, could have done it with the accept language to find it or whatever. The interesting thing is this runs right on the edge. This is not in the browser, it's not in a server that's far away. So it means that, that redirect happens very, very quickly. And because Cloudflare has really good connect connectivity to the internet, the, the checking to see if that country specific page exists happens very rapidly. And you're going through the Cloudflare cache. So the first time you do it, that gets cached. The second time, you don't even have to go back to the origin. So again, really tiny bits of code make a huge difference. Um, 
there's an old piece of functionality called edge side includes, which allows you to have a sort of templating language, which allows you to do something like this, which is here's a web page, and then oh by the way, I'm going to include and go get this URI. And uh, we had a customer who wanted to ditch the vendor that had this in it, but they didn't want to strip out the ESI include, so they wrote themselves a parser for this. So what they did was um, it's possible to stream the response coming back from the origin server. So they, they fetch the page. When a page is requested, they go and fetch the page, and they stream through it, and they look for that, e this is how they do it with the regex, ESI colon include. And once they find that, they do a sub request. So one of the magic of these workers JavaScript things is you can go in and do arbitrary numbers of sub requests. So you can call APIs, you can download other web pages, merge them together and synthesize a response. And this is all happening asynchronously, so it doesn't use much CPU. You're, you're allowed to do that on the edge. And so they do a sub request and off they go. And the sub request is literally, you know, they just call fetch, wait for the response and get the response back and put the page back together. So we've seen people do stuff like that. Um, let's just talk about drones. There are, you know, non-recreational uses of drones. There's a company called Drone Deploy, and what they do is they deploy drones, um, clever name, but they, they do them for industrial purposes. This is a heat map taken using a drone of uh, a solar power farm. So the dark rectangles are actually the solar panels making electricity, and you can see they're absorbing a lot of sunlight. They're very, they're, they're, they're turning into uh, energy. But if there are dead photovoltaic cells, they can be easily seen using a drone because the heat looks different on them because they're not converting the heat into electricity. And so what they do is they deploy the drone, it takes all these pictures and they merge it back together again. The stuff is happening in the field in all sorts of random places. And one of the things they wanted to do is they wanted to make sure that their application was protected against people accessing this data. And bear in mind, this is happening all over the world in random places. And they just decided they would <coughs> they would verify JWT on the edge. So they check the JWT in a, in JavaScript in a worker, and if it's invalid, then they just reject. And the th key thing here is they're rejecting right on the edge. It never gets near their server. So if someone's messing around trying to get into pictures that are stored in their, their in this case they use Google, uh, they just can't because the JWT is done on the edge. Um, and the JWT is handling is this, all these examples in there, and I have all these. I can give them to everybody. Are really really small. So it's just like, you know, get the JWT token from the authorization header. Check it. Is it valid? No. Reject. And that's me done. <laughs>